Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Rutgers Geology Museum's Ask a Geologist web series. Um, so today I'm really excited to introduce um, a good friend of mine. So uh, she is Nicole Conklin, and she currently works at the Liberty Science Center as an animal keeper. And she's also a PhD student at Antioch University in New England. And today she will be speaking about misunderstanding with us. Um, so without further ado, Nicole, uh, go ahead and tell us all about sharks. All right, thank you, Ria. Um, so, oops, there we go. So as Ria mentioned, we're gonna be talking about sharks today, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this misunderstood part as we uh, go through the presentation. Uh, but just to start with introducing myself, uh, my name is Nicole. Oh, you can't hear me. I don't know why. Can everyone else hear me? We can okay. hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, perfect. So uh, my name is Nicole, and as Ria mentioned, I do work as an animal keeper at Liberty Science Center. So you'll see uh, me holding a jungle carpet python here, and then at a past internship, me with a harbor seal. So why did I start working with animals? Well, since I was really young, I really loved the ocean. And my love for the ocean really kind of then expanded to the natural world and everything outside. So as you can imagine, my favorite animal is a shark. Uh, so my love for the ocean and sharks inspired me to go into this career of not only caring for animals, but also teaching younger kids about them and even adults too, and getting them to get that connection to nature and wildlife and the world around them. I'm also in school getting my PhD in environmental studies, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about my work later, which as a surprise includes sharks. <laughs> um, and since we're presenting for the Geology Museum today, thought it would be cool to mention also my favorite dinosaur, so we have Copsignathus, which is my favorite dinosaur, and mostly just because they're really tiny and they're about the size of a chicken, and I just think they're so cute. So that's my favorite dinosaur. So enough about me, let's talk about sharks. So how long have sharks been on Earth? This really cool picture here shows pretty much the history of Earth since the beginning of Earth's existence, and you'll see each organism on this little chart here has a black line with them. So you'll see we have our dinosaurs and their black line is only in this Mesozoic area. It doesn't go all the way up to the top, which is where we're at today. At the top, you'll see we have humans are around today, mammals, reptiles, their line starts all the way down here, goes all the way up to today. Amphibians, they've been around for a very long time. But you'll also see this black line all the way down here goes for sharks. And their black line keeps going down all the way to the Devonian period. So what does that mean? It means sharks have been on Earth for 4.10 million years, much longer than the dinosaurs, and they're still around today. So how do we know sharks have been around for that long? These are just some things that sharks leave behind that fossilize uh, that help us to understand how long they have been on Earth. So some of these things like their vertebra, uh, rostral nodes, teeth, cartilage, these are just some things that sharks leave behind that we can use to help date back and know that sharks were around for 4.10 million years. So because sharks have been around for so long, they are very diverse and adaptable. So we're gonna talk about what both of those words mean. They're very diverse, meaning there's lots of different kinds of sharks. There are more than 500 different species of sharks. And those range from very teeny tiny sharks, like our, we talked about uh, Copsignathus being very small. This here is a dwarf lantern shark. And it's not a baby, they're that small. They um, are small enough to fit in the palm of a human hand. And then all the way ranging to our biggest shark, which is a whale shark. So you'll see a person in comparison to this whale shark, much bigger. 
Now, these are just examples of the smallest and the biggest shark. But like I said, there's 500 different species. So here's just some more examples. You'll see um, a nice visual, right? There's some big sharks, medium sharks, very small sharks. They have really silly shapes like our hammerhead sharks, our goblin sharks. So these are just some more examples of different types of sharks. But as you'll see, there's not 500 different sharks on this picture, but there are 500 different species of sharks out in the oceans. So now let's talk about that second word, adaptable. So this here is a map of the world and these darker blue areas that have numbers on them, like one through 18, those are all areas where all these 500 species of sharks live. So you'll see it's pretty much worldwide. Sharks live all over the globe. So adaptable means that they can live in very warm waters, like you see here, or they can live in very cold water. So you'll see there's this big iceberg here kind of showing you that this water here is very cold. And you can actually see there's a shark in this picture. This is a Greenland shark and they live in these very cold waters. So adaptable doesn't just mean warm or cold water. They can also live very close to the surface of the ocean, hang out in the middle, or dive very deep into the ocean. So sharks also range from very close to the surface to very deep in the ocean. So because sharks have been around for so long, and because they're so diverse and so adaptable, they're very important in keeping marine ecosystems in balance. And they're important in many different ways. We're just gonna dive into one example for this presentation. We're gonna talk about how sharks affect the food web. So if you look at this food web here, sharks are at the very top. They're what's called apex predators, some sharks. Um, so that means that no other animal in the ocean is going to feed on sharks, but they feed on other fish. If we were to remove our shark from this food web, our tuna wouldn't have any predators. So that means they would reproduce a lot because there's nothing eating them. They have no danger. So that would mean there's lots and lots of tuna in the ocean. If you look at this food web, you'll see the tuna eat herring, squid, and anchovies. So if we have all these extra tuna and they're all eating the herring, squid, and anchovies, there's not going to be enough for all these new tuna in the ocean. So our tuna might go hungry. And then also, they may cause some of these species down here to go extinct because they ate them all. And then that affects the whole food web and everything underneath that you see down here. So that would all happen if our sharks were removed from the oceans. Now, this is just one example of what would be called a cascade effect. So removing sharks would cause all problems with the rest of these species. So that means sharks are very important to our oceans. We need them in the oceans. But as you see here, sharks are in trouble. There are a lot of different things that are affecting shark populations in the ocean. We're gonna talk about a few. So the first one we're gonna talk about is pollution. So pollution in the ocean can get stuck around sharks because they don't know it's pollution. So you'll see the shark here is stuck. But also there's other forms of pollution too. So here is just an example of something called mercury. And mercury, either through the air or through runoff, makes its way into the ocean. And we're gonna go back to talking about our food chains. So our krill in the ocean get that mercury in their system. Then our salmon that eat the krill get the mercury in their system. So this little red line here shows, okay, they have some mercury in there, but not all the way to the top. But then as we move up the food chain, this trout now has the mercury that our salmon and our krill had in their bellies. So our trout have even more mercury in their system, which is not good for them. 
And then we have our apex predators, our sharks eating the trout who have ate the salmon, who have ate the krill, who all had the mercury in their system. So that causes our sharks to have really, really high levels of mercury in their bodies, which is not healthy for our sharks. So that's just another example, two examples here of how pollution affects our sharks in the oceans. Now we also have global warming or climate change that is influencing our shark populations. So I'm gonna pull up a really detailed picture, but we're only gonna focus on two parts of the picture. We're gonna focus right here and here. So climate change can cause something in the ocean called ocean acidification. It could change the context of the ocean. And ocean acidification can affect senses that shark use to hunt their prey. So something called an olfactory sense. So sharks might not be able to smell out their food because the ocean is really acidic and that's due to climate change. Then if we come over, we have our example of our thresher, our thresher shark. Thresher sharks eat migratory fish species. So if fish species are migratory and they're not getting what they need in this one area of the ocean because the ocean is changing due to climate change, they'll swim somewhere else. And now our thresher shark is left here with no fish to eat. So those are just two examples, two very simple examples of how climate change might affect our sharks. But pollution and climate change aren't the only influences on our sharks. Humans kill about 100 million sharks each year. Now this happens through a few different ways, through something called bycatch. So I'm gonna give you guys an example. So say this fishing boat here is going out to catch a bunch of tuna. They have things like these big nets that they wanna catch the tuna in, or sometimes they have really long fishing lines. There's no picture of that here, but it would be a really long fishing line that has all these hooks on them. And sharks and other fish don't know that these fishermen just want tuna. So they can get stuck in these nets or stuck on the fishing lines. And accidentally, these fishermen are killing lots and lots of sharks through these different fishing methods even though they don't mean to catch sharks. So bycatch is mostly accidental, but it is still affecting shark populations. We also have the purposeful killing of sharks. So people use sharks for many different reasons. A picture I have here, you might be wondering, why do I have a picture of food? So this is something called shark fin soup, and you'll see it's a bowl of soup, and then we have our shark fin on the side here. Shark fin soup is a very fancy soup that is served in China. So it's very expensive and it's very fancy there. And sharks are being killed just for kind of an ornament, just to kind of say, hey, this fin is here, so that means this soup is fancy and you should pay more money. But this shark had to die for that very silly purpose of making this soup fancy. So, I know it might not make sense. It's, it's kind of silly, but many sharks die from just the shark finning alone, just to get their fins for that soup. But humans use other parts of sharks for many different reasons. So shark skin is used for a substitute for leather. So if you ever sat on a leather couch or had a leather bag or shoes, that leather substitute could be made from shark skin. Shark livers are used in things like makeup. If you've ever been in a gift shop and you've seen a shark tooth on a necklace, those come from a real shark. There's also other uses. You'll see their flesh is used for, for meat. People eat shark meat. And also their eyes and the cartilage that makes up their skeletons are used for medical purposes for people. So there's many different ways that humans are using these parts of a shark and contributing to those 100 million shark deaths each year. Now, all of this 
global warming, pollution, humans killing sharks, the accidental bycatch, that has had a toll on our shark populations. And shark populations have declined by about 80%. There are many, many of those 500 shark species that are endangered right now. So you may be wondering why aren't we helping sharks? If we know they're endangered, we know things like this bycatch is accidentally happening or people are purposely killing sharks, why aren't we doing anything to help them? Well, this all stems from a fear of sharks. So if you guys are here, I would imagine that you have an interest in sharks. You may have heard of the movie Jaws before. Jaws was a movie that came out in the 1970s, so a little over 40 years ago. And this movie showed sharks as kind of this unintelligent animal, not very smart animal, that swims around the ocean just looking to eat people. Now, we'll talk later about how that's inaccurate. But because sharks are a real animal and they were put in this movie, kind of got in people's heads and made them think, oh my gosh, maybe this is a thing that could happen. Maybe sharks are really just out there looking to eat people. Movies are still made today where sharks are the bad guys in these movies. So you'll see we have this picture of Bruce from Finding Nemo here. And movies today are still portraying these sharks as the bad guys. And seeing this over and over and over can really get in our heads and make us really afraid of sharks. We also have things on TV, news stories or newspapers that only report when a shark comes in contact with a person. They're not really reporting on the declining shark populations. Do you guys really hear in the news very often about the endangered sharks or about research happening with sharks? Not really, when sharks are on the news, it's mostly because they're either close to shore or they've come in contact with the person. So there's a real bias in what we're seeing in these news stories on sharks. So we're not really seeing the positive things. But this is not true. Sharks are not unintelligent animals swimming around in the ocean just looking for people to eat. We mentioned 100 million sharks are killed by humans each year versus nine humans on average each year that are killed by sharks. Now I know what we're thinking. That's still nine humans. Why are nine humans dying from sharks each year? Well, it's mostly a case of mistaken identity. So you can see here, so pretend we're a shark, we're underneath the water and we're looking up at the surface, looking for some food. Our food sources include seals and sea lions, and turtles. But if you look at this image here, you see this is a person on a surfboard. This person on a surfboard looks awfully similar to our food, our seal and our sea turtle. So a lot of the times when sharks interact with a human, it's because they think it's their food. Most of the time, sharks may take a little bite and they think, oh, this wasn't my food, and they swim away. It's not like in movies like Jaws where they bite a person and they stay around to try to eat the person. It's not really like that. It's mostly a case of they spit it out and they're like, oh, no, that wasn't my food, and then they swim away. So that's why we are still seeing um, a number here for the sharks killing people. But we have this nine compared to 100 million each year. So where does my research come in? What do I wanna study in my PhD program? I want people to rethink sharks. I want them to stop thinking about sharks like this mindless, unintelligent animal trying to eat people. And I want them to think about sharks as a very beautiful creature that's very vulnerable. They're not dangerous. They're vulnerable animals that really need our help. So how am I doing this work? How am I gonna change people from the beginning of time being afraid of sharks and starting to appreciate and care for them? 
well. This can be done through something called framing. We can just simply change the way we are speaking about sharks and just starting with changing the way we talk about them can help us to start thinking about them a little differently. So I have some examples here. We can talk about sharks in a way where we compare their similarities to people. This can help us to identify with sharks and kind of understand them a little bit better. So an example I have of that, you guys see this, this toy here. You may remember when you were little, you had these blocks and you tried to fit them into the proper shapes. Well, bamboo sharks can actually differentiate shapes like our triangle, our square, and our circle that we see here, that we used to do when we were little. Bamboo sharks are that intelligent that they can also differentiate these shapes. So something as simple as providing that information to people, that can help them to identify with sharks. Oh, I didn't know sharks were that smart. I didn't know that they could do something that I can do. Now that second bullet point we have here, is individualizing sharks. What does that mean? Well, say we're at an aquarium and we see a shark in a tank and we ask the person working at the aquarium, hey, who's that shark? Oh, well, that shark is Janine. And Janine likes to hang out towards the bottom of the tank when it's feeding time. She lets all the other sharks in the tank go to the top and they eat first. And then when they're done, Janine will swim up and then she'll eat too. Say that's a little story that our person working at the aquarium shared with you. Well, now you are wondering, oh, that's Janine. You have a name for this, let's say, sand tiger shark. So now you know, okay, Janine is a sand tiger shark and she likes to let her friends eat first. She lets them eat and then she's very polite and she'll go eat after. So something as simple as just a little story about an individual shark helps us to learn to care more about the species of sharks. And then also I have here framing in a way where we show the true nature of sharks. So showing more images like this, where we have a person swimming right next to a shark and our shark doesn't really care. It's just minding its own business. And something as simple as just seeing that helps make that connection in our brain that, oh, wait a second, why is that shark not attacking that person? Oh, because it knows that that person's not their food. It knows that that person's harmless and just swimming next to them and sharing the ocean with them. Now, in addition to framing, we also have something called perspective taking. So we can take the perspective of a shark, like we did in that earlier picture, and then you can see in this picture here. So I'm gonna give you guys an example of uh, perspective taking. I want you to imagine your favorite food. Let's say my favorite food is pizza. And I give you a juicy burger, right? You see this burger and I say, oh, but when you bite the burger, there's pizza inside. It's gonna taste just like pizza. So you're so excited, you take this burger, you're expecting to taste pizza, you take a bite and pff, it's broccoli. I was not expecting broccoli. So what did you do? You spit it out. Oh, I thought this was gonna be pizza, not broccoli. Well, when sharks see a human on a surfboard and they think it's gonna be a seal and it's not a seal, pff, they spit that out and they swim away. Oh, I thought that was gonna be a seal. I, did, I don't even know what that was. So something as simple as a story like that, where you take the perspective of a shark and get people to think about sharks in that way, where you can relate to them, that's something that can help us. So my work, I mentioned a few times that um, aquariums. So a lot of us aren't really going to see sharks in our lifetime out in the ocean. We're not swimming all the way out in the ocean and we're not, and some of us might not be looking for sharks in the ocean. So a lot of times our only interaction with sharks is going to be seeing them in an aquarium. So aquariums are important in providing a lot of different experiences. For one, they're important in 
doing those framing and perspective taking education points. So that is a certain way that they can teach to get people to kind of think about sharks differently. They can provide, you'll see this person here, right? He looks like he's cleaning the tank and this shark behind him is just kind of hanging out, not really trying to interact with him at all. Something as simple as seeing someone clean a tank at the aquarium can be an education experience that helps change our minds. Now, a lot of, shark, a lot of aquariums and other places uh, like science centers have touch tanks where you can actually stick your hand in this tank and touch a shark. What's a better learning experience that sharks are not mindless animals trying to eat people than actually sticking your hand in a tank and getting to touch one? So experiences like that are very helpful. And then you can also see things like training sessions. So we talked earlier about bamboo sharks being able to tell different shapes apart. So we know that sharks are smart. This shark here is trained to go into this stretcher for some kind of medical procedure. I don't know what, what they're doing with him, but he's trained to go into this stretcher by himself. So as a guest at an aquarium, seeing something like this can be very helpful in just saying, oh, sharks are smart. This shark is choosing by itself to go into this stretcher and it knows that, okay, I'm gonna get food when I go into this stretcher and also, you're seeing this person, right? This shark is swimming right past the person to do the behavior that it wants to do. So experiences like that are very important. Then we also have organizations such as OSEARCH, which is an organization that goes out into the ocean and they do something called tagging sharks. So they will put little satellites on the sharks that doesn't hurt them, but it stays on their fins and it helps researchers to know where these sharks are in the ocean. Now, OSEARCH, they're doing a lot of scientific research with numbers and not really what I'm doing. What I'm doing is more studying psychology and how people think about sharks. But OSEARCH has done something really cool in that way. They're not just tagging sharks, they're naming each shark that they're tagging and providing people an option to follow the track of this shark. So you'll see here, we have an example. This is Fletcher. He is a tiger shark. He's a male. He's 13 feet and four inches long. And we can see all these places that Fletcher has swam to. So that goes back to that topic of individualizing sharks and knowing more about this specific shark and where he's swimming in the ocean, that can help us to create a connection to sharks. So the work OSEARCH is doing is very important in both the scientific realm, but also in changing people's perceptions of sharks. And then the last thing is accurate media portrayals of sharks. So we had that whole slide talking about Bruce from Finding Nemo and Jaws and human and shark interactions in the news. These here are positive portrayals of sharks in the media. So this is a children's book showing what would happen if sharks disappeared? Kind of showing the importance of sharks in our oceans. This is a news clip, not showing a human shark interaction, but showing, oh wow, this is a way, new technology that researchers can use so we can learn more about shark. A positive story in the news about sharks. And then we have one of Rob Stewart. He's a gentleman that makes lots of documentaries about sharks. And actually you can see sharks swimming in the real ocean next to people and learning more about their true nature. So, why is my work important? How is, how is changing our opinions about sharks going to help shark populations in the oceans? How are we gonna get those sharks back in the oceans? So, my work is important because getting people to understand and not fear sharks can help get support for sharks it can help us care about them and say, hey, I care that short fin mako sharks are endangered. How can we help get those numbers back up? Oh, there's this petition I can sign. There is money I can donate to this cause. So there's different behavioral aspects that can follow caring about sharks. 
And these behavioral aspects all lead to one thing. That is policy or laws that can protect sharks. So we talked about something like bycatch happening. There are different laws that can be passed that can actually help protect sharks from getting stuck on these long lines and in these nets and help bring down that those number of sharks that are killed each year due to bycatch. So by getting people to care about sharks, we can do things, like I said, like we can sign petitions that are in favor of laws for sharks. We can donate money towards campaigns that are trying to help sharks. We can write to our local congressman to say, hey, how come there's no uh, law about this bycatch and catching shortfin mako sharks? So getting that support is really important in getting to the behavior part and getting these laws made that can help sharks. So that is it for my presentation. Um, we are going to, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to get to some of your questions that you guys may have about my work, um, about changing perceptions of sharks, or even um, just about sharks in general. So I'm going to pull up your questions, have them somewhere. Oh, sorry. So I see I had a typo in my uh, in one of my earlier slides. I said 4.10 million years. I meant 410 million. So sorry about that. Um, good catch. Okay, so we have some questions from Mary from Scotch Plains. So Mary from Scotch Plains wants to know, do you or other scientists expect to find new species of sharks? So that's a great question. Um, yes, so many of the oceans are still unexplored and we don't know who is there. So it's very possible that there are species of sharks that we haven't come in contact with yet. Um, right, we mentioned there's over 500 different species. That's over 500, so there could still be ones. I know that um, earlier this year even, there were two new species of, of sharks discovered. So that's even in 2020, we're still finding that there are different species of sharks. Um, I'm gonna go through a few of Mary from Scotch Plains questions and then get to some other ones. Um, how fast can sharks swim? What is the fastest kind of shark? Um, so I'm going to answer that second part um, about the fastest kind of shark. So that is, and I mentioned it, uh, this kind of shark a few times in my presentation. Um, that is the short fin mako shark, and they can swim up to 35 miles per hour. So um, if you think about in the car, you're typically going 25 miles per hour. So short fin mako sharks can go 35 in the ocean. Um, when sharks migrate off the coast of New Jersey, where are they going? North and south. So, research like we saw with OSEARCH's map can actually help us learn more about that and more about where sharks are going in different seasons of the year. So, sometimes sharks are going up to like Massachusetts area, sometimes they're going up further to Nova Scotia in, in Canada. Um, that's when they go north, and we learn that through OSEARCH's uh, work and other uh, organizations that tag sharks. And then when they go south, it's usually like North, South Carolina, Florida. It really depends on the shark, the species, and the year. I would recommend, if you're interested in knowing more about uh, shark patterns and where they're swimming and different types of the year when they're swimming. Um, I would recommend downloading um, OSEARCH has an app that you can use to actually do things like we saw Fletcher specifically. We saw his pattern in the ocean. You can do that and see what sharks are, are near New Jersey. And you can click that shark and see, oh, well, in 
September of 2018, it was all the way down in Florida. Um, so that's usually where they're going, but research is ongoing and helping us find out more about those swimming patterns and where they are going. Um, do sharks swim all around the globe? We kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, yes, they live all over the world. Um, not So we mentioned our Greenland shark living in those very cold waters. That shark only lives in cold waters. It won't be swimming to warmer waters. But there are some species of sharks that prefer, prefer both. Um, so that. Okay. I'm going to move on to some other questions. Uh, Rhea's mom wants to know, is COVID-19 affecting the behavior and health of sharks? So not so much their health. Um, and I don't, hmm, that's a good question. I know that, and I know I keep talking about OSEARCH, but that's just an organization that I know um, a lot about. They go on expeditions a few times a year um, out in the ocean where they actually um, will go to a certain area and they'll, they'll tag sharks. So they have um, like two to three of those expeditions each year. And they actually just had one in from September to the beginning of October. And they were still able to, to get sharks in the way they normally do to tag them. Um, they found about the same amount of, um, of sharks. So in that aspect, I wouldn't say behavior or health has really seen a difference yet with COVID-19. Um, I don't know who asked this question, but I see what is my favorite shark. And my favorite shark is probably the typical one everyone thinks. It's the great white shark. And that is because I feel so sorry for the great white shark and the way that it was portrayed in Jaws. When I was younger, I saw the movie Jaws and I, instead of being afraid, I was like, whoa, that is such a cool animal. And then through thinking it was a cool animal, I did my research and I learned more about their true nature. And I was like, oh my goodness, just like my presentation today, I was like, this shark is so misunderstood. So I think because that great white shark is the shark people see a lot in, in the media and in movies. It's kind of that gateway into learning more about other species of sharks and more about uh, the ocean. So they were kind of my gateway into learning more about all the work I'm doing now. So great white sharks for sure. Um, let's see. Oh, that question was from Rhea. What was my favorite shark? Um, have you ever seen sharks in New Jersey? If yes, what beach was it at? I have not seen any sharks in New Jersey, um, but they are um, out there in the oceans. Um, this is an area where sharks um, can live, um, but like we said, remember, let's not be afraid of sharks. We are sharing the ocean with sharks. So. If you guys have been in the ocean in New Jersey before and you haven't seen a shark, don't be afraid to go in the ocean now that you know that sharks are in New Jersey oceans. Um, like I said, I highly recommend those of you asking specific um, geographic questions. There's not just OSEARCH, there are other um, apps too that you can see where sharks are and where they are um, in relation to where you are. So there are many different organizations that do track sharks and you can definitely learn more about them through that. Okay. Okay. I have Patty asks, how do you know sharks can identify geometric figures? So the fear of sharks has impacted the amount of research that we do with sharks. Um, there is surprisingly very little scientific research on what we know about sharks. However, there have been some studies um, that have done some really cool things trying to learn from shark, uh, 
shark intelligence. So one of those uh, behavioral studies was um, having sharks in a in a controlled setting, not in the ocean. Um, and they found that I want to pull up the information, but they did find um, that sharks were able to um, identify those different. Uh, I think I said before, triangle, circle, and square shapes. Um, they were able to differentiate. It wasn't similar to um, the little example I pulled up where we would put it in a box like that. It was um, some other kind of controlled setting. But there have been um, different types of research like that um, in recent years uh, now that we realize, hey, we need to know more about sharks so that we can do better for them. So um, I'm not sure of the exact conditions of that study. Um, I just know the results because that's what I work with. I work with the results and what we know from sharks and how can we frame that in a way that can relate to people. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the questions here, there's a ton. How did sharks change over the years? This is a question from Allie. So great question. Since they've been around for 410 million years, they have changed very drastically. Um, and we can tell this mostly from their teeth. Um, we can use that to kind of give us an idea of what those sharks ate and um, what they looked like based on, um, I had that one slide that had all those um, examples of things like the vertebra and the rostral nodes that they leave behind. Um, I have a few questions asking, um, this one I just see from Aaron, but I did see a few others asking if sharks can interbreed. Um, kind of, I think I, the question earlier was like, like a lion and a tiger to make a liger. It's not very likely for sharks in that way, where like a great white would breed with a whale shark. Uh, but it is possible in sharks that are not so different. So um, in 2011 in Australia, this was kind of big news, they found that a common black tip reef shark um, interbred with a with another type of black tip reef shark. Sorry, I don't know the specific, uh, but they were both black tip reef sharks, just different species of them, and they did interbreed. So it's possible in examples where they're more closely genetically related, but not so much, um, like I said, like a great white and a whale shark interbreeding, but it is, it is possible in 2011, if you guys wanna look it up after is the most recent uh, evidence we have of that. Um, Mary wants to know what laws do we, the U.S., already have about sharks? There are many laws in the U.S. in regards to the shark finning that I mentioned earlier. Um, that is that very fancy soup in China. It it's actually so it originated there, but it's fancy and a delicacy in other places as well. So. Up until, you know, a few years ago, it was legal in California to cut the fins off of sharks and use them for that soup. There are many laws today, it's not legal in California anymore, but usually by state, um, not so much the US as a whole, but by state, they will make these laws. So there's currently, I've mentioned the short fin mako quite a few times. Um, there is currently some laws trying to be passed to protect them and fishing limits um, on those types of sharks because they are were recently listed as endangered. Um, so the US as a whole is a country that is not signing on board with that law to be passed to set sustainable fishing limits for that species. So it's kind of, it's interesting when the laws come into play because there's state's laws, there's the country's laws, and then there may be laws about specific species of sharks. So um, there are lots of laws that need to be passed though, but 
a good start is those finning laws that are in the US and we're trying to get um, in China more awareness and get those laws passed there as well. Matthew would like to know if sharks had legs in prehistoric times. They did not. Uh, they always had fins and they were always in the water. They, they did not come on land. They were not terrestrial. Um, and I, I saw a few questions earlier asking if, if some sharks were terrestrial and came on land, um, whether in the past or today. And no, they do not. And they never did, not even in, in prehistoric times. Um, sorry, skipping around. Um, if you eat sharks, can you possibly be getting mercury poisoning? It is very likely. So we did mention sharks, people do eat shark meat, and that is one of the reasons why they um, are killed, is for consumption of their meat. And we mentioned, right, we talked about the little krill eating the mercury and that bioaccumulation going all the way up to the shark and the shark having really high levels of mercury. And if people are eating shark meat, there is a very strong chance that they could uh, be getting that mercury in their system as well. So that was a very good question. As everyday individuals, how can we help reduce ocean pollution? So that was one of the things we talked about affecting sharks and affecting the whole ocean. So as everyday people, what we can do is we can reduce our single use plastics. So we can stop using straws, which I know is a very popular um, movement going on right now. We can get reusable water bottles so that we're not um, using single um, use plastic water bottles. Uh, we can, I'm a very strong advocate for, for not littering. If there's one thing I don't like, it is littering. So we can do things like participate in beach cleanups where we as a group walk along the beach and, and collect that litter. Anything that gets on the ground, any litter is going to make its way into the ocean somehow. So even if you're in Pennsylvania and you litter there, even though it's not directly next to an ocean, it can make its way into a river and then make its way into the ocean later. So really a strong focus on advocating for not littering, not littering ourselves, and also individually reducing how much we are using single use plastics. We can also try and help by things like volunteering for beach cleanups and things like that. Okay. Sorry. Okay, Rio would like to know, do sharks do well in aquariums mentally? What about great white sharks? So great white sharks are not held in aquariums. You will not see a great white shark in an aquarium. Uh, fun fact, there are sharks that look similar to great whites that you may perceive as a great white shark, but um, aquariums do not hold sharks in aquariums. Uh, aquariums do not hold great white sharks. Um, so uh, that answers that question. Mentally for sharks in aquariums, they do pretty well. They live out their lifespan. Um, they're also great for research purposes, not you know, conducting research on them, but knowing how long do sharks live? What is an ideal condition for them in the ocean? Um, what kinds of foods are they eating? Things like that can help um, with knowing more about sharks out in the wild as well. And then I kind of mentioned earlier too, uh, there's things like, like training programs for sharks that help them get mental stimulation as well. So those things really help um, help them to think and use their minds too. How small is the smallest shark? So we talked about, I showed a picture of that dwarf lantern shark. That is the smallest species of shark. I'm not sure the exact length of them, but um, they would fit in your hand. So um, just picture your hand, dwarf lantern shark would fit in there. Um, so you guys can oh, that. Sorry, Nicole, I just looked it up. I think they could be 20 centimeters. 
which is pretty small. Very yes. cute. <laughs> Thank you, Ria. 20 centimeters. And yes, that does sound very cute. Okay. Do sharks, oh, Philip. Hello, Philip. I know you. Uh, asks, do sharks use a lot of, do sharks lose a lot of teeth in their lifetime? Yes. So unlike us, where we have one row of teeth and we lose a baby tooth, we get an adult tooth, that's it. Sharks are continuously losing teeth. Um, I like to think of it as like a revolving escalator. So if you guys have ever been on an escalator that goes up or down, um, their teeth are kind of like that. They have rows of teeth. So if they lose one in the front, they have another one right behind it ready to go. And it's not just their one adult tooth, because if they lose that, they have another one ready to go. So sharks are continuously losing teeth throughout their lifetime. Okay, sorry, Philip also asks, are sharks and dolphins natural enemies? How long have I been studying sharks? So I've been, I originally got into my career with working with animals um, from my interest in sharks. So my first uh, internship was at an aquarium um, where I learned about the stop finning campaign and I learned about all the conservation issues facing sharks. Um, so that was in 2012, so about eight years. And are sharks and dolphins natural enemies? I wouldn't say that. Um, I would say if a shark hadn't eaten a seal or a turtle in a long time and there's easy prey, maybe an injured dolphin, um, I would say it would definitely, a shark would take that opportunity uh, to eat the dolphin, especially if it's injured. That's another reason why sharks are very important to the ecosystem. They get rid of all the, the sick and injured fish. Um, but I wouldn't say they're enemies. I would just say a shark would definitely take the opportunity if it if it presented itself in an easy easy way for a meal. Okay. Sorry, scrolling through some of the questions. Okay, Carrie would like to know. Where do lemon sharks live? Lemon sharks live in the Atlantic coasts of North and South America and Western Africa, and they also live in the Pacific coast of Mexico. Hernan would like to know, is it possible to remove mercury from a shark's mouth? Unfortunately not. Um, so the way sharks eat their food, so say they're eating a tuna and that tuna already has that mercury in their belly, it's not just in the shark's mouth, it's now going through their body and into their belly now too. So it wouldn't be possible to just to just remove it that simply um, because of how the mercury is getting into their system. It's getting into their system through their food and through their food before that and their food before that. So it, it's not really possible to remove that mercury from, from the shark. Ahmed would like to know, are sharks the most feared animal in the ocean? Now, I don't know this for sure as a fact, but just from my experience um, with doing this research and reading a lot of papers and looking back at the history of human and shark interactions, I would say they, are pretty up there with, with one of the most feared uh, ocean creatures for people. Um, yeah, I would, I would feel pretty confident in saying if they are not the most feared, they are very close to, they're fighting for a number one spot. Um, I have the question, Ethan asks, if great whites get overpopulated, would more humans die? That is a great question. Um, unfortunately, I would say that the way things are going for many sharks and in our oceans right now, it's not very likely that we would see an overpopulation of any of our shark species 
Unfortunately, most of them are on the decline. Um, shark, uh, great white sharks, I think was the question specifically. Um, yeah, the question was great white sharks. So they are not um, listed as endangered. However, since, like we mentioned earlier, most of the oceans are unexplored and we don't really know, we don't have enough research on sharks to know a lot about their populations. They also travel all over the world. So a lot of species of sharks may be declining, but we just don't know because we don't know how many were there to begin with. So something like our great white shark, I know I'm going a little off topic, but something like our great white shark, they are not listed as endangered. Um, but like I mentioned, there's no real possibility anytime soon for sharks to be overpopulated. Unfortunately, it's going in the opposite direction. Are the sharks eating, ha oh, Paige, this is from Paige. Are sharks eating habits changing due to climate change? That is a good question. Um, yes, some of, we do have evidence that it has been changing. Um, there was an instance uh, where more sharks were in either North or South America, and I'm sorry, North or South Carolina, not North or South America, North or South Carolina. And, um, because the waters were, were warmer there, they hung out there longer, and they had um, eaten an abundance of a certain kind of fish. And because the weather brought them, the conditions of the ocean brought them to that area, and that caused them to eat most of the, that particular fish in that area, that fish went extinct in North or South Carolina. So that's just one example of climate change influencing where sharks are migrating, which then influences that area. Okay. Hey, Nicole. So we, I think we probably have maybe time for two more questions. Um, so I'll ask you one. Uh, this is from Zoel. Um, so Zoel would like to know, have you ever seen a colorful shark? And if you have, what were they called? Sure. So, hmm, let me think. So not personally, so anything I've seen is uh, through a picture, but I'm trying to think my colorful sharks. Um, there are maybe not colorful, but I would say maybe like the pattern. Um, sharks have interesting different patterns. So something like um, we have something called a zebra shark and not, they're not necessarily very colorful, they are gray, but they have really cool spots on them, um, which make them appear a little bit, a little bit different from what, what you would think. Um, so not necessarily super colorful. Um, something like our, our Wabagong shark, um, they also have an interesting pattern, but even though the patterns are interesting, the colors are still kind of like a, a darker kind of color. Um, okay, one more. I'm trying to find one I didn't see yet. Sorry, guys. I was kind of jumping around. Okay, so I'll, I'll end with this one. So Ethan asked um, if sharks get mercury in their system, do they die? Um, sharks are actually very good at um, living with a lot of mercury in their system. So the things that would be affected from mercury in a shark system is not necessarily the shark as a whole. They found that um, they have tested sharks for their mercury levels and they are are very, very high, but the sharks are still living and as they could tell behaving normally. The thing with sharks consuming mercury is people that then consume the shark meat. So that could get in people system due to them eating the shark meat. Um, but sharks are, as far as we can tell, um, have been surviving and mostly okay with, with those high amounts of mercury in their system. Um, but Obviously, as I said, we need a lot more research in this area, so we would need more research to really tell what those impacts would be. 
All right. Um, so that is the end of our program today. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was so interesting. Sharks are one of my super favorite animals too. So I really enjoyed that. And thank you to all of our viewers today. There were so many of you who turned out today. So thank you for watching. And you guys sent so many amazing questions. Um, thank you for all of those. And we're sorry if we couldn't get to all of them. Nicole tried her best to answer all of your questions as best as she could. Um, so thank you again, Nicole. That was really awesome. And so for our viewers, uh, the next uh, episode or series right, will be on Friday, November 6th at 1 p.m. Uh, we will have Dr. Tammy Giovanelli, uh, who is an associate professor of geology at Barry College. And we will get to hear all about the geologic wonders of Iceland. And I can assure you there's a lot of geology to talk about there. So definitely don't miss that. It's going to be on Friday, November 6th at 1 p.m. And once again, thank you so much, Nicole. It was great seeing you and have an amazing weekend. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys for your questions.